welcome everybody to uh, another summer pizza talk. Um, it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce to you Davina Two Bears. She's a Dine or Navo from Northern Arizona who recently graduated from Indiana University. Uh, she has a PhD in anthropology with an emphasis in archaeology and a PhD minor in Native American Indigenous Studies. Her research documents the history of the Old Leup, and I hope I don't mispronounce it, the Old Leup boarding school on the Navajo reservation. Uh, and this was a federal Indian boarding school from 1909 to 1942. It was one of the major Navajo Indian boarding schools located in the western side of the Navajo reservation. Yet its existence and contribution to early Navajo education had never been thoroughly researched and documented. Although very many memories associated with the boarding school existed in the oral history of the local communities. Um, Davina's interest is what constituted the daily lives of Navajo children and how they resisted and maintained their Navajo identity, their language and the culture, uh, despite the United States government's attempt to assimilate them. Her research incorporates archival research and oral history interviews with Navajo elders. So without further ado, a warm welcome and uh, let's listen to Davina. Thank you for that introduction. I would first like to begin by acknowledging the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples as the traditional caretakers of Tabanga, the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of Los Angeles Basin and the Southern Channel Islands. Yat eh? Shit, Davina two bears, you know, she had twitter cheating and shlin touching me, but she's cheating. Tabahi dasha che, do tuja cheating, dasha nala, city taught then nasha. Hello, I'm Davina, and my clans are Bitterwater. I'm born for Red Running into the Water clan, and I am originally from Bird Springs, Arizona, on the Navajo reservation. Um, before I just pursued my PhD, I was a, a tribal archaeologist with the Navajo Nation Archaeology Department for 14 years. I was responsible for seeing cultural resource management projects um, being done prior to development projects and recording archaeological sites that are within the right of way. And we also um, did some excavation um, during roads projects and that was about the only time that we also did uh, some fun, not fundraising, um, public outreach. And I decided to go back to school at IU because I realized that many of the Navajo sites on the reservation were not being in-depthly researched. And this has to do with um, the fact that a lot of the, the archaeologists are more interested in the um, ancient uh, Puebloan cultures. So many Navajo sites, even though they're important to the communities, such as the Old Loop Boarding School, they get overlooked. And so today I'll be discussing my dissertation research on the or Old Loop Boarding School which is a federal Indian boarding school that was located on the southwestern Navajo Reservation in Loop, Arizona. And it's a personal project. And this project stems from my grandparents' stories that they told me when I was a child about their experience at the old Loop boarding school. And I was very interested when I went back to school to research a place that's important to my community and be able to share the information that I gathered. So I knew that the Old Loop Boarding School is some, a place in my community that's very significant and there's a lot of oral history about this school. And so um, my interest in doing archeology span is that I would like to continue my research of places significant to the Navajo people and um, that may not necessarily be uh, receiving archaeological or any kind of historical research. So um, 
just a little background about boarding schools. Uh, Captain Richard Henry Pratt developed the idea of the first Indian boarding school um, at, um, from his time of taking care of, uh, or not caring, but overseeing prisoners, Native American prisoners at Fort, Fort Marion. From there, he got the idea to have a militarized structure similar to Fort Marion to educate and assimilate Native American children in the late 1800s. And he got approval from the United States government to establish the fourth, first Indian boarding school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And so at this school, um, many uh, Native Americans who were fighting for their lands, they forced the um, children of these um, parents who were, um, for example, in North and South Dakota fighting for their lands, they forced them to, they were one of the first um, groups of um, nation, Native nations who had, were forced to send their children to Carlisle. So this map shows all of the federal Indian boarding schools that were built after the United States government um, deemed Carlisle a success. And so 23 more uh, boarding schools were built across the United States. And um, these boarding schools provided elementary academic training equivalent to the lower grades in public schools alongside manual and domestic training while enforcing Christianity. And so for the Navajo, we actually had in our treaty of 1868 that we signed with the US government that um, they were going to, the government was going to provide for every 30 children between ages six and 16, um, a school and a teacher. But the reality was that the US government did not fully honor this treaty obligation for many decades due to inadequate funding to build schools and hire teachers sufficient to educate all um, Navajo children. But nevertheless, in the early 1900s, the federal government established five agencies across the Navajo reservation. And the Loop Agency was one of the five agencies that was established in 1908. And typically, um, agencies, they monitor the resources and um, the Navajo people in each agency. So the Loop Boarding School, the livestock and all the resources of the Navajo people. So the Loop Boarding School, um, was built in 1909, January 4th, 1909, it opened its doors. So it's, um, this school was one of two schools on the whole western half of the reservation, and the other school was Tuba City Boarding School. And it was built just like a quarter mile of, uh, from the Little Colorado River. So it was built a quarter mile east of the Little, um, I'll, actually at that time, the river ran, um, on the eastern side of the school. And during the time the school was open, the river channel changed to actually run on the western side of the school that was established. And what happened was that they built the school in a floodplain and many times the school was flooded. At this time in the early 1900s, many Navajo families, they made their living along the Little Colorado River, which, um, Mostly it runs during um, the winter and also if there's um, um, like monsoon or rainstorms and sometimes the river will be dry, but it, it can get very violent if it's running fast. So um, my grandparents and great grandparents lived along the Little Colorado River. So you can see all of the schools here that were established um, and Luke is here in the Southwest corner. It's near the cities of um, Winslow, which is um, here, and Flagstaff, Arizona. And these are all the, on the left side of the screen, you can see all the different federal Indian boarding schools that were built on the Navajo reservation, most of them on the eastern side of the reservation in the early 20th century. Um, this slide shows our sacred mountain of the west, and the Navajo people have four sacred mountains. And what's significant to me is that both the Little Colorado River and the um, Dog the Sacred Mountain of the Navajo Sacred Mountain of the West, they are um, essential to our ceremonies, our, our religion, um, 
especially the sacred mountains are um, very, very important to our philosophy, our religion, our ceremonies, and they continue to be um, sacred places to this day. And the sacred mountain is like our mother. She's watching over us and protecting us. And this picture on the right, this is the view from the old boarding school site. And you might be able to see a little bit on the right, the, um, the earthen mound, which was a dike that was built eight feet high on the north side of the school, as well along the eastern side of the school to keep out the floodwaters when the river flowed just east of um, the old Luke boarding school. But six, what is significant is that children were um, not, who went to the old Luke boarding school were not displaced. Um, they were still within the traditional homelands of the Navajo people, and they could clearly see the sacred mountain of the West every day, watching over them, giving them strength. And, um, this is something I think that is very different it, if they were um, like shipped off to Carlisle or to other schools that were off the reservation. So this, um, I argue, gave them strength to survive Federal Indian Boarding School, their experience at Loop. Okay, so this is, this, um, is the old Loop Boarding School, how it exists today. It's an archeological site. It was torn down sometime in the 1960s one of the Navajo elders I interviewed said 1966, but I still haven't found the exact date. The um, Bureau of Indian Affairs came in one day and totally bulldozed the whole entire school and these beautiful stone structures um, that were made from local sandstone. Um, the campus or the site measures approx approximately, approximately 125 square acres, about 1,000 meters by 500 meters. So this is how it looks out there today. And many families in Bird Springs and Loop, Bird Springs is just um, west of the old Loop boarding school. That the, the boundary between the Bird Springs community and the Loop community pretty much runs through the old Loop boarding school. So Bird Springs, many families, including my grandparents who are from Bird Springs, attended Loop boarding school. And this is um, a sidewalk, a remnant of a sidewalk that was in front of the um, hospital, which was located on the um, western side of the school campus. And I um, was here with a, a student from NAU just taking notes of all of the features that we encountered. And this just gives you an idea of how it looks out there. There, there are many features on the ground, and I didn't. Um, this site is so large, but it has not been recorded by um, anyone, not the Navajo Nation or, nor any other archaeologist, even though there's many features on the ground, many historic artifacts. And that is my goal to, um, I didn't do it with my research, but I would like to do this in the future. Um, this just gives you an idea of what's out there. And I like this picture. I took this picture in this uh, past December because I wanted to um, show the intricate uh, work, stonework that's being done. And like many of the buildings, this is how they would have been constructed. And this is how the stone would have looked. These, this was a house that was um, a Navajo family had been living in once the school was, um, demolished and that's why they didn't demolish two houses that were the only things that survived that demolition uh, because Navajo families were living in them. The other house is the superintendent's house which is located next to this house and there is still a Navajo family that lives there to this day and they are actually doing a very nice job of renovating that house, the superintendent ha house. I've been in there and it looks very nice. And um, I also was able to um, share my results. And that's something that's really important to me because many of the archeological projects done on the Navajo reservation are not shared with the Navajo public. The reports are written and they, are, um, go, they go to the archives and are pretty much never seen 
except by other archaeologists who are doing records checks. And so it was really important for me um, to make sure that I make that connection with my community. And also I've given um, two, two presentations at conferences, the Navajo Education Conference and also the Navajo Nation Human Research Review Board Conference um, that took place in Window Rock uh, this past fall. So um, I also have plans to write a book and maybe a children's story. And I'm doing this to, for my community, but also I'm not just doing this for my community, but I'm also doing this work so that other people can be educated about how um, the US government treated uh, Native American children in the early 20th century and how they separated them from their families and didn't allow them to uh, practice their culture for the most part and speak their languages and um, in, in boarding schools. So my research is um, framed by post-colonial and survivance theory. And um, I'm very interested in how children um, within the Luke boarding school reacted to colonialism, how they were, um, you know, resisting assimilation. That's what I'm interested in. And Gerald Wisner, who's an Anishinaabe writer, talks about survivance. He says, survivance stories are renunciation of dominance and the legacy of victimry. And so, um, can you just turn that off, Mom? Yeah. And so I think that this is something that I'm really passionate about, this whole idea of not portraying Native Americans constantly as victims. I want to show the strength, the agency, the creativity, the intelligence of my people and other Native Americans, instead of always portraying them as victims who have um, suffered. And so um, although I know the, the elders shared some horrible stories with me about what happened to them when they were punished for speaking their language, but I, I'm also interested in those those stories of how they continued to speak their language. They knew they were gonna be punished, but they still continued to speak their language. And so they never lost their language um, in federal Indian boarding schools. So our stories are also about how we survived assimilation. And, and that's what I want my research to focus on. And I do focus, um, incorporate decolonizing research methods which Linda Tuhiwai Smith talks about in her book. And she um, talks about different projects that we can do to um, decolonize research. And, and these projects, again, like are focusing on survivance of indigenous peoples. They're focusing on what indigenous communities want to be researched. And that is why I, I know, um, went to my community and this is a significant place in Loop and Bird Springs, and they want the, the community wants to know more about this place. And so I'm following Linda Tuhiwai Smith's project in decolonizing research methods. And so I'm providing in, um, insight into resistance and survivance. And then I also um, wanted to um, look at how culture and the, the Navajo culture, um, how it does that affect children and how they're resisting and surviving. And that's something that Sherry Ortner talks about with regards to resistance studies and anthropology that um, many times it's the culture of um, um, groups is not considered, the culture and religion of groups is not considered in, in stories or in resistance studies. And that is her critique. And so I wanted to um, address that in, in my research. I'm studying the um, Navajo culture and how that I see um, that uh, is a foundation for resistance for um, the children within federal Indian boarding schools. And Celia Haig Brown studies residential schools in Canada and she studied resistance and she identified it by um, asking her interviewees how they broke the rules. And so this is something that I incorporated with my research as well. This is an aerial view and of the Olu boarding school. And um, as an indigenous archeologist, I have um, the idea of doing non-destructive research method and also culturally sensitive research of archeological sites. 
I often get very uncomfortable when I'm um, excavating and that's why I don't really do it. Um, however, I, 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 it's like a hard thing for me as a Navajo archeologist because I, I do, I enjoy the field of archeology, span but at the same time, I don't enjoy the legacy of the, the, the field of archeology span and you know, the, the, how it has not often included Native American perspectives or consulted with Native people when researching what we consider our ancestors, the places where our ancestors lived and died. And then, you know, the whole um, thing with uh, taking human remains, Native American human remains, and, and how many of them still exist in, in um, institutions and, and museum collections, despite the fact that NAGPRA has been, you know, uh, a, a law for over, you know, 20 years. And so this is um, going on, on 30 years. So this is, you know, as an indigenous archaeologist, I have an interest in archaeological sites. I have an interest in my community's history, but I want to be able to research those sites using non-destructive research methods that are culturally sensitive. For me, that translated to doing oral history. Um, that is the correct, you know, uh, culturally, um, that is the correct way to learn is from your elders. And that's what I wanted to do in researching the Olu boarding school site. And I also um, did go to um, National Archives in Washington, DC, um, Riverside, California, and also in um, Denver, Colorado. And I went to the Navajo Nation Museum archives where I found beautiful photographs of Luke Boarding School. And they were taken by Milton Snow, who was a government photographer in the early 20th century on the Navajo reservation. And he went to many boarding schools across the reservation and took photos. So there are many methods that as archeologists we can em employ that are non-destructive. And I think that a lot of my indigenous archeology span colleagues are employing those um, like LIDAR or ground penetrating radar or using drones to map sites. And so um, oral history was my way and also archival research of researching the old loop boarding school. Um, I interviewed 10 Navajo elders and prior to conducting these interviews, I obtained permission from the Navajo Nation Historic Preservation Department and the Navajo Nation Human Research Review Board. So I just didn't go out there and start, um, you know, collecting data. I had to do these things. Even though I am Navajo, it's still required of us that we do this. And it's, it's a significant thing that the Navajo Nation now requires all researchers to state their aims and goals of the projects and what benefit does it have for the Navajo people? Because in the past, many researchers have done research on indigenous peoples and have left and never come back to the community, never shared the information. And so now tribes are implementing um, permission, um, IRBs. And so my mother initially introduced me to Navajo elders, Ardith Curley and Hope Harrison. And from there, um, I was able to get more names of Navajo elders who attended the Old Loop boarding school in the early 20th century. And I sat down and visited these elders in their homes in the community of Loop and Bird Springs and also uh, Flagstaff and Winslow, Arizona. And I um, recorded them and um, if they wanted me to take their picture, I took their picture. And so most of my questions I asked of them were about uh, the history of the Olu boarding school, their daily lives as, as students, um, and what did they ever break rules and what happened and how um, they were punished. And if, if they spoke the Navajo language in school and also um, what happened if they did that. And so, um, these are pictures of some of the elders. This is Alex Riggs at the top. He's from Loop. And this is Gertie Hydro and Gertrude Hydro. And this is um, another informant from Burt Springs, Arizona. And it's really sad because it was hard for me to find elders who attended Loop because most of them are in their early 90s now. And um, many of the people who attended Loop boarding school have passed on. And, and then some of the people that I, like the Gertie and the man on the bottom of the screen, they have both passed away um, recently. So it's really sad for me 
but it's also, it was a very rewarding experience to be able to learn from my elders. And it, it just left me feeling with such a good feeling. And um, I have gone back several times to visit, to visit them. And I also gave them a copy of my dissertation. So this was the uh, original building that was built in 1909, again, made of local sandstone. And it was the Loop Indian, at that time, they called it the Loop Training School. And this, the, the, it held everything within this one structure. There is an open co courtyard and they had the girls and boys dormitory, two classrooms, a kitchen, a dining hall and bathrooms. And the openings were on the north and south side into the courtyard, which were large enough for a truck to drive through. So um, my grandfather was very upset when he discovered, learned that all of these buildings had been demolished in 1966. He stated it was such a waste for that to happen. So this was the first structure that was built in 1909. And then um, at that time, they could only have enough uh, room at the Olu boarding school for 70 students. And many families were bringing their children to school. And at that time, the river was running and um, they were actually wading across the river with their children to bring to Loop Indian School. And there, it, it's interesting to me to like wonder what, why, what compelled them to bring their children to federal Indian boarding school. I know some parents had to do that, um, like they weren't able to care for their children. Maybe uh, the parents had died and so the children were orphans or um, other situations is that the Navajo, I mean, the US government hired Navajo police to round up children. So police would actually come to threaten uh, families with jail. And that's actually what happened to my grandmother. Her father was threatened with jail if he did not bring her to um, the loop boarding school. And so this picture is of the the, the the school building that was built in 19, 1923. And Mr. Alex Riggs, he recalled that on top of the doorway, it says Loop Indian School 1923. So you can see that little sign above the doorway and that's what it says. And he shared that with me, he drew a picture of that. And so this, this school building had an auditorium in the back and it also has an open courtyard in the middle, just like the other um, first building that was built at Loop. And so when the school was built in 1923, the other building that I just showed you became the boys and girls dormitory. And, um, and also they built a second story on it. So this building, they built a second story in the early 1920s, and then it became the boys and girls dormitory. And then this just became the school where they had classes, and then they um, had an auditorium in the back of this, um, school building and they showed movies the elders i talked to recall them showing movies in that um, um, auditorium and there was a lot of construction that went on in the early 1920s to make the school bigger and have more enrollment so this is a picture of the construction that the uh of the dining hall that could feed about 300 students and that happened in 1920 and then also in 1927, there was a hospital that was built, a new hospital. And the, uh, this building that is in front of the, the hospitals in the back, and you could see the uh, Little Colorado River that is right behind the hospital. And you could see how the flooding, um, just imagine how that could occur so easily. And the hospital looks like it's built on stilts. And then in front of the hospital is um, the school that was built in 1923. So. None of these buildings are there anymore. So in the early 1920s, there was a large uh, increase in enrollment to 400 students. And that was the highest number of students that attended the Loop um, boarding school. And here is the power plant that was at um, Loop. And it was um, a coal fired power plant. And this provided the heat for the school as well as heated the water. And there was a train depot about 12 miles away. It was called the Sunshine Train Depot. And that's where earlier they would send telegrams out of the Sunshine Depot from Loop. And many of the faculty or administrators, when they were coming to Loop, they would take the train and they would get off the train at the Sunshine Depot, which was located about 12 miles away at Diablo Canyon. 
and men transported uh, coal from the train um, just about almost every day. So Navajo men were hired to um, have coal put into the wagons. So at this time they didn't have trucks, they had wagons and horse-drawn wagons and they would um, haul coal to uh, the loop boarding school just about every day. And they also, um, the coal also powered the laundromat and made ice. And so that is a picture of uh, the power plant. And this photograph was shared with me by um, Ardith Curley, who was one of the elders that I interviewed. So the water that was um, th that the school used was um, pumped up from the aquifer, which was located about 80 feet uh, under the ground surface. And it was put into a high receiving tank and then piped to all the buildings. And um, the sewage was dumped into the Little Singer School directly. So this could be um, very hazardous during uh, flooding because then the sewage would, I'm pretty sure would back up and be uh, floating around all the school buildings uh, affecting the children's health. This is a, a, a map that I found of the school that was done in 1941 and by the US Indian um, Service. And so this is how the campus looked in 1941. And um, you can see in the center, that was the original building built in 1909. And southeast of that building right here is the um, dining hall. Can you see my map, my arrow pointer? Okay. And then directly behind the um, dormitory, there was a home economics building. Part of it was for the girls and the other half was for the boys. And here is the school that was built in 1923 um, and back here was the auditorium. So here's the open co courtyard and also the open courtyard on the dormitory. Here's the hospital. There was a Presbyterian church located on the west side of the campus and um, north there was faculty housing on the north and eastern side. So all of these buildings were demolished in the 60s, except for these two houses were, um, um, or I think it was this, this house and that house where Navajo families were um, living. And this is a, the dike. This is the dike I was talking about that was built. It's eight feet high, it's still there. And what's interesting about the dike is that many children went over the dike to be, um, to um, not be, uh, get out of the view of the school, get away from the school. And so the, the eastern side of the dike, you can't see, um, you can't see because the dike is so tall, you can't see on that side. So many of the students would go over the dike if they did not want to be seen. So to me, the area east of the dike is an area of resistance that students took advantage of when they were not, when they did not want to be seen or they wanted to escape the, the boarding school. And so when they were on the eastern side of this eight foot high dike, they were out of um, surveillance, they could not be seen. And um, so that's an interesting thing um, about the, the dike that was meant to keep out the floodwaters, but it also had a, another role as, um, a place where students could go if they didn't want to be seen. So again, enrollment, um, it was um, started off at 70 children and when the school first opened in 1909 and the highest um, enrollment occurred in 1927, 1928, 29 to like 400 students. And there was a huge flood in 1929. The campus flooded several times and, but the, there was a huge flood in 1929 and 1930. And these are um, pictures that I found in the National Archives of the flooding that um, you could see all the flood waters. And this, this is a view up the top photograph facing west. So you can um, see the campus there. And then the bottom photo photograph, uh, the, the men are standing on the dike watching the flood waters there. And so when, when um, flooding occurred, students were bused and transferred to different schools, like Winslow ha um, had a um, boarding school there. And then also, well, it ha they had a dormitory, but the, the children at Winslow, they would go to the public school, but they would stay in the dormitory. And that's actually where I 
graduated from high school and that dormitory run by the uh, the government, the Bureau of Indian Affairs still exists. Um, anyway, um, also students were sent to other schools like Fort Apache, um, even as far away as Phoenix Indian School, Tuba City Boarding School, and um, Ardith Curley remembers when the campus flooded and they had to walk across the bridge of the Little Colorado River. Um, there's two uh, metal bridges um, uh, that still exist but aren't usable and so they would have the children walk across the bridges to where the land was a little bit higher and they would get on buses to go to different schools during the times it flooded. And the next slide just shows you, um, I got this information off of enrollment records of why students dropped out. They had a section on the enrollment record that where they recorded um, reasons why students dropped out. And so it was really kind of shocking to see that they also recorded um, 24 students that actually died at Loop Indian School. And this is a common phenomenon at federal Indian boarding schools where unfortunately um, students um, because federal Indian boarding schools many times, you know, physically they were um, um, overcrowded or they didn't have um, very much, the children are always starving and of course being uh, separated from their families. Uh, many, many students passed away in boarding schools and so this is something um, that I, I guess I, I it, it was shocking to me to see that um, on the enrollment records even though I knew that this is something that happened. So um, the Spanish influenza hit loop in 1918 and there were some students who passed away at that time and there were many um, um, epidemics that came to um, sweat through and took um, um, children and passed away but they had to deal with measles, chicken pox, smallpox epidemics and also um, two diseases which really uh, were um, the children were suffering from were tuberculosis and you can see on this that um, 26 kids dropped out of school because of tuberculosis and also trachoma. Um, could you tell me how much time I have left? Five minutes? About five minutes, yeah. Oh my god. Oh dear. Okay, so there's gendered vocational training for both boys and girls. And girls usually learned how to sew and also do um, a cooking for their vocational training. And boys, they had more opportunities for them for vocational training, like blacksmithing, carpentry, um, working on the farm. And the students had very full lives. They were busy from sunup to sundown. They started their morning at 5.45 a.m. They were in school till four or five o'clock in the afternoon. They had them going to church on Saturday and Sunday, the, there was a harsh militaristic environment. And Hoke Denasosi, he was the only person that wrote about his experience at Loop. And he talks about how it was run um, in a very harsh militaristic environment. Students had to march around wherever they, whenever they had to go from place to place. And also they, um, um, he talks about how um, um, he was cared for by his, um, aunts at the school who are also attending the loop boarding school and that's some of the stories that come out is really focusing um, like on my grandfather and my grandmother my grandmother she cared for my grandfather at the loop boarding school and she was a very um, nurturing and caring caring person she took care of a lot of the younger students including my grandfather because she thought she was related to him and even though they were the same age he was much smaller than her and because he was um, a, um, born as a premature baby and so she would watch over him and many other the, of the Navajo children and she would try and make sure that they got enough food to eat. And my grandfather actually, the story that I have about him is he that he told me that he built a, um, he had refashioned a real gun out of a toy gun he got for Christmas at Loop and he used to go hunting so if he went beyond that eight foot high dike, he would be able to hunt without being seen. So him and his friends would go hunting for rabbits and they would make a fire and cook their rabbits. And so without being um, seen by the, the teachers and the staff, and this was their way of getting enough to eat. And so this just shows when I found my grandmother's name on um, an enrollment record 
at Washington DC and um, she was seven years old at the time of this that this record existed and she it says also that she started school in 1925 so she was only six years old because she was born in 1919 so the younger students were usually in school all day and the older students uh 10 10 on up were starting to do their vocational training and loop had a problem in 1920 where they were um, purposefully retaining older boys teenage boys and older teenage girls because um, older students would would go to school at loop they had students there from the age of five even all the way up to age 19 and the the staff at loop were retaining older boys and older girls so that they could um, work at the school and they were criticized um, when they were inspected by the US government and um, they criticized loop for doing that because several of the older boys were retained in the same grade for like three or four years and they were being made to work at the farm because there was a couple of farms at Loop and the boys had to work there. And so they didn't go to school. They were just stuck at the farm for several months and um, they weren't allowed to go um, take their academic classes. And um, the school was doing this because they were using the boys to provide the labor to, la the labor to run the farm. And also the girls were being stuck in the laundry, the older girls. And so this was a problem that happened in the 1920s. And then the Miriam report came out in 1928 where um, the Brookings Institute did research of all the boarding schools across the country, or not all of them, but a lot of them, Indian boarding schools. And they were gave a scathing report about all of the um, different things that students were experiencing, like you know, malnutrition and overcrowding and their health was not good. And, so as a result of the Merriam Report, many changes happened in the 1930s where um, the United States Indian policy began to um, have Navajo or all federal Indian boarding schools incorporate the culture of the tribes. And so this happened at Loop. I was really surprised that they actually had Navajo weaving class. And this is what the photograph shows. And Ardith Curley talks about this. And so does Hope Harrison, learning how to weave at Loop boarding school. And Ardith Curley, she was um, teaching students because she already knew how to weave when she when she attended because her mother taught her. And so I was very surprised and shocked. And I, to me, this an ability for students to reconnect with their cultural identity is, um, you know, by psych psychologists, this is a way that um, people are able to strengthen themselves. And um, I see this as a way students have resisted because they were given this uh, opportunity to connect to their culture. And not only that, within the safe zone of the weaving class, they could converse with their teacher who was Navajo. And you also see her here. Her name was Marie Martin. And she, at this time, they could talk to her in the Navajo language without being punished. So that was really significant for me to find um, out from the elders. The elders are the ones that told me that they could, they were weaving, learning to weave at loop and that their teacher was Navajo. They could talk to her in the Navajo language. And then when I went to the, the archives at the Navajo Nation Museum, I saw that, that, that this was something that students were doing. And not only that, they were, students were able to re maintain their kinship bonds um, especially Hope Harrison and Lucinda Machen, who were two sisters raised by their grandparents. Their grandparents would visit them on the east side of that dike. They would come in their horse-drawn wagon and they would bring them traditional foods like mutton, melon, and corn. And they would share not only that food with their granddaughters, but also with other kids at Loop. And they would actually donate food to Loop as well, like mutton. And so this was a way that the students continued their kinship bonds with their grandparents, even though they weren't allowed to leave school, their grandparents continuous, continuously came to visit them and feed them traditional foods. And um, not just them, but other kids as well. So um, Alex Riggs is, also talks about him being nurtured by older, an older student and just older students taking care of younger students because there was bullying and he was not getting enough to eat there. And so there was an older student who would make sure that, she, that he could eat. And so these kinship roles continued to take place and the um, traditional um, um, mothering or, or roles of genders such as 
um, how Navajo women can't take care of um, younger children. These continue to occur within the context of the Olu boarding school and help the students to survive their assimilation, help to keep their language intact, and their, um, some um, strengthening of their cultural and identity through the Navajo weaving classes. And although they, they, they were punished though, when they did speak Navajo inside their academic classrooms, they were punished. And then kinship again was reinforced through the sharing of food that the children often did with one another, just like my grandfather and how he was continuing his subsistence um, by hunting rabbits and sharing that with his friends because they were starving. And so again, family relationships continued despite the students not being able to leave the school, as I said, with um, Ardeth, I mean, um, Hope Harrison and Lucinda Machen, who were the sisters. So future work I'd like to do on the Old Luke Boarding School, I, 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 I need to publish a book on my research. I really want to do that. And also I would like to do the um, Japanese internment history of the Old Luke Boarding School. When it closed in 1942, it became a Japanese internment camp. It's called the Loop Isolation Center. It existed there for nine months. They imprisoned the troublemakers from all the other Japanese internment camps. Um, and there was about 70 Japanese men, uh, um, American citizens, who were imprisoned at Loop at a time when um, the Navajo Nation or the U.S. government, the United States was at war with the Empire of Japan. It's, there's a lot of ironies here because um, at boarding schools in, you know, they were notorious for not being able, not letting Navajo students speak their language, but yet the Navajo code talkers used the language to help win the war against the Japanese empire. And then we have Japanese American citizens imprisoned at loop. And um, so many ironies upon ironies. And I Thank, want to thank the UCLA Costin Institute of Archaeology for having me today. Thank you all for listening, and um, um, it's been a pleasure.